I'm a consultant radiologist working in the UK, Essex to be more precise, a uh, wonderful part of the world. I trained in London actually most of my life. I was not a part of Chelsea Imperial and I mainly do musculoskeletal radiology. So I'm really interested in bones and joints. And in the beginning, I was all like, oh, you know, I'm going to like do like athletes and stuff. But actually, it just turned out to be crumbly old hips and things. But um, I enjoy it. I still, I still enjoy it. I absolutely love it. And um, I'm really into medical education, as some of you may be aware. And um, yeah, I'm really kind of quite excited to try and help you guys. I don't know, hopefully learn a few things from me about Gosh. kind of the struggles that happen when we do vetting, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, let's see. Hopefully I'm, it's useful. I'm sure we will. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. I really appreciate you. Yeah. Taking time out of your day to um, help us create this sort of flow diagram for our students to mm. to work off in the future. So mm. we'll sort of jump straight into it. And uh, mm. this is our random patient scenario. Hopefully you can see okay. that. So we've got our patient name mm. here. Mm -hmm. We're definitely going for a CT. Mm -hmm. Someone's decided it's an abdomen. But part of our okay. job, obviously, is to decide whether that is the correct area or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, here's our clinical history, which we all know is mm. uh, often not that detailed. So yeah, here's a good example. Yeah. So this person's obviously had an MVA. They've got a bit mm. of an increased heart rate mm -hmm. and quite a low BP, and they're a little bit pale. Okay. Next bit down here, which so, is the last bit, no allergies. GFR is quite normal, but this patient is pregnant. So yeah. we will okay. go down to... What are your first thoughts in terms of differentials? Because for me, as a radiographer, that's the first thing that I'd be thinking. I'd, I'd be thinking, what's the radiologist thinking? So given that you're here, mm. let's uh, jump straight into that. I mean, so first of all, I, I, we can see this patient in 1995, so they're fairly young, okay? So then that kind of puts you straight down this particular area of like what kind of problems you may be expecting for someone quite young. But the big thing here is that they've had what well, sounds like an accident, a motor vehicle accident, right? So you're thinking probably trauma, so quite an extensive amount of trauma. Yeah. And you think to yourself, okay, so this is going to be, you know, they're going to have maybe some broken bones. There's a whole load of things that can happen, lacerations that can happen, injuries to large vessels, and such as the aorta, the IVC, and those kind of anatomical areas. And then obviously pelvic fractures could be a really big thing in, in these sort of big traumatic sort of injuries, such as motor, you know, when you, depending on what kind of motor vehicle they're in, but generally speaking, pelvic injuries can happen, even if you are like a passenger. And, you know, the seatbelt goes across the front, so it can happen. So those are the things I'm thinking of straight away. Now, the thing is, when you go to blood pressure, you can see it's 80 over 40 and they're pale, right? So that's a very low blood pressure. And being pale, even if you didn't know what blood pressure is normally, you know that they're pale. So someone's only going to be pale if they're losing blood somewhere. So they may be hosting blood outside of the body and then they may not have written it, but they haven't written anything about that. But then they could still be hosting blood inside the body. And there's so many cavities that blood can accumulate and result in this sort of what is essentially hypervolemia from, from the sounds of things. And so, so there, there's different kinds of scans you can go towards depending on what kind of impact this patient has had. But those are things you're thinking of straight away, right? And even with something like uh, internal bleeding, there's a whole load of other differentials that can come from internal bleeding. So if you've got someone who's got hosting blood and they've got a sort of hypovolemia, there's something called a hypovolemic um, syndrome that can happen. And so what happens is when someone's bleeding a lot, whether externally or internally, the body starts to divert blood to the more important organs, you know, and all organs are important. You know, I'm a cardiologist. I'm entirely happy about me saying, or the <laughs> renal physician would be happy about me saying that not all organs are, well, some are more equal than others. Right. And so they'll have very specific appearances. If you've got something like hypovolemic syndrome, and if it gets really bad, then you might have a lack of blood supply to specific areas of the body, such as the bowel, and that can result in sort of ischemic bowel and stuff. So it really depends on where along the patient journey we're at and how bad this initial injury really is. And so then you've got to start thinking about, okay, so what kind of scan are we looking at and how bad was the injury? So at the moment, they said examination of the abdomen is required. So one would assume that they've examined this patient and they're not worried about the chest. But you still got to be a bit wary because when you've got high impact injuries, it may just be better just to get a CT chest, abdomen, and pelvis because they, even with, I've seen situations where someone's had such an extensive blunt injury of the abdomen, it raises the intra-abdominal pressure so much, you can actually get a thoracic injury because it actually causes the perforation of the diaphragm and result in, you know, hernia, you can have herniation of intra-abdominal contents into the, uh, into the chest. So you're kind of thinking about like, 
almost the worst case scenario. So the CT scan needs to cater for the worst case scenario for this patient on every level. Because the last thing you really want to do is go with just abdomen, right? And then find that you've only scanned the top bit of the, the pelvis, but there's like a bit of a fracture. So now you don't know whether there's a pelvic fracture or you scan just the upper bit of the, uh, the upper bit of the abdomen, which includes some of the chest. And you can see there's a tiny pneumothorax. Now you don't know like how big this injury is already going to be. You have to bring them back again, maybe do another bolus of contrast. So those are the things that I'm thinking of straight away with something like this. So okay. personally for me, I would, you know, I'd talk to clinicians say, listen, how worried about are, are you about the chest? Have we done a chest x-ray at least to try and figure out like how extensive this injury is going to be? And regardless of what they say, they've written abdomen, but I'll probably do abdo pelvis, most likely. I don't see any reason. If you're going to scan that, you might as well scan the abdo because there's going to be bowel structures that are going to go all the way to the pelvis. And like I said before, when you think about the seatbelt, the way it goes across, it goes right along the bottom from one hip bone to the other hip bone, the anterior superior iliac spines. So if you just do the abdomen, you may not be able to see that further impact that may happen from that sort of forward motion, that inertia that can happen from you know head-on collisions. So regardless of what they say, this is going to have to change to a CT abdo pelvis without doubt, uh, undoubtedly. From my point of view as a radiographer, the first thing, like you said, would be to check that actually nothing else needs scanning. Because I think mm. in this kind of, especially if it's high speed, in this kind mm. of scenario, you're pretty much going to be doing a pan, a pan scan. Most likely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not just a limited area. So I guess the point that I want to reiterate is just because it's written on the form, it doesn't exactly mean, it doesn't always mean that that's what you're going to end up doing. So have the have the confidence to question these forms because mm. they're not always 100% right. If you've got a patient that's trying to die on you, basically, you know, a mm. junior person may have written the form and not given you all of the details or all of what's required. So it's certainly a really good idea to be not questioning, but discussing with the referrer whether this mm. is the appropriate examination. So that's really a really good tip there. The next bit I would say is this patient's pregnant. Uh, a lot of our students would stress oh my god mm. patient's pregnant but to me there's a certain sort of set of rules that we follow in terms of pregnancy and and this one mm. obviously might be a life-threatening situation and so the pregnancy yeah. kind of takes a second second seat to all of that what's your take on this yeah i completely agree, agree with you i mean in a situation where it's, it seems to me based on the blood pressure and the paleness of the patient i mean if a scan is not done, we don't know what's going on. The pregnancy is secondary. And it sounds it sounds kind of horrible, but at the mm. same time, if mum doesn't survive, baby doesn't survive, you have to, you have to, you have to do the scan. You have to know what's going on in there. Even more so because they're pregnant, right? Because I mean, the thing is, like we said about the seatbelt, depending on how far along the pregnancy is, there could be significant blunt injury to the to the to the little patient inside as well. And you're never going to know that. And you, you don't know whether you need the gynecologist involved as well in the in the care, whether it goes to trauma surgeons slash gynecology. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So th I think yeah, in this particular situation, it's like you know, it, it's a lie. It's a li both lives will benefit from the scan, and that's when you think about sort of the overall the benefit of the patient. So in these situations, you think to yourself like, yes, you know, the long term implications of radiation to a baby is not great, but they're also the imminent passing of both patients is not great either. So you've got to do something, and I think this is almost negligible when when you've got scenarios. Absolutely. I just want to chuck another spanner in the works in terms of the mm -hmm. um, EGFR result here. Just mm -hmm. imagine, I know it says creatinine, but just ignore that bit. Just imagine that this patient mm -hmm. did have, uh, say, an EGFR of 15, but they still come mm -hmm. in with this, you know, they're a chronic um, renal dialysis patient. Would that mm -hmm. make any difference to you at all? No, not at all, really, because thing is like um if someone is as sick as what they they've implied by the limited information that we have they're going to be going to itu and getting hemofiltrated etc cetera, etc cetera. i mean they're probably going to do quite a lot for this patient i mean they're young so it's more, more i mean obviously it's less likely but yeah like you said if they're older you still i think i mean the maximum you may want to do if you want to be 100 percent careful is call them up and say egfr is not great. Are we going to dialyze in this patient right now? Uh, yes. Thinking about that. And then more than likely, there'll be yes, there's patients for everything. Yeah. In that case, this, this scan has to happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in my experience, mm. that would be the case. But the, the next mm. point that I'm trying to gonna sort of reiterate for my students is if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So if anything like this out of the ordinary does happen, uh, just make mm. sure that it's clearly documented and stored within our radiology information system because Sometimes, you know, when 
things have settled, somebody might say, well, how come you did this or how come you did that? And if it's documented, mm. you can always go back and say, because of this, <laughs> because mm. of so uh, <laughs> yeah. we always blame the radiologists. All right. Yeah, that's great. That's <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. All right. That's cool. So I guess in terms of our protocols, the only other thing, and, uh, and we try and refer our students to literature and evidence, of course. So mm. in this case, oral contrast would not be necessary given the acuity of the patient. But is yeah. there, are there any situations within trauma and, and the abdomen where oral contrast might be positive for, pardon the pun, uh, of positive assistance to you? Not in these kind of scenarios, right? Because no, not this day, scenario, but likely, say, yeah, like a stabbing. Um, yeah, it can be, it can be useful in some situations. So, like if you've got someone who's got post-surgical abdomen or something like that. Yeah, I think there are scenarios where it's useful. But the thing is, like when you're giving oral contrast, you've got to also think about the consciousness of the patient. Right. So there's no point in giving oral contrast to the patient's unconscious and you don't have an energy tube and that kind of thing. Right. How are you going to give the oral contrast? They could aspirate, et cetera, et cetera. So in those sort of scenarios, you have to be aware that there are there's going to be a spectrum of consciousness, which is going to be give you the ability or non-ability to give oral contrast. Obviously, oral contrast would be fantastically useful, even in, in this sort of scenario, because such a uh, raised intra-abdominal pressure can result in perforations of the abdomen and, and leaks. But you don't be hanging around either because when you give contrast into the into the stomach, you have to wait for it to go around the small bowel and the large bowel. You have to give it some time. In time sensitive situations such as this one, it seems to be you don't want to be hanging around waiting for the contrast to go through the abdomen. You want to be doing oral contrast if someone's had surgery and they've got, you know, they're worried about dehiscence, they're worried about a leak, they're worried about those kind of things. Or even with this patient, let's say we didn't have, we did the initial scan. And then for some reason, they've ended up having a swinging fever later on, right? Then it's possible that maybe they've had a perforation. And then you'd, you know, they, then you'd think about doing an NG tube and all the rest of it. But in an acute situation, I don't think it's very, very useful to give oral contrast. But just on the subject of contrast in places that are not injected, I would say that sometimes it can be very useful to do contrast into the urinary bladder. Because sometimes you get these stabbings and that kind of thing where you get extra peritoneal injuries of the urinary bladder or extra peritoneal injuries of the urinary bladder. And it's all to do with anatomy. But in, I don't know if this is the case in Australia, but we had this real situation of stabbings in the UK. And what they were doing was coming up from behind and stabbing the patients from behind. And there's a whole yeah. kind of, they're very, very smart about the way they're doing it. Because if you stab someone from behind, it's like grievous bodily harm rather than attempted murder. And so that's what they were doing. And it's also crazy. from stabbing from, it, yeah, it's really amazing the kind of thought process it goes through. And also, if you stab someone from behind, they were actually trying to go for the rectum because they don't want to hurt the per, they don't want to kill the person, yeah. but they want to permanently debilitate the person so that if you made such a massive inc incision onto the rectum, they end up having to have a stoma bag for the rest of their life. And so they're very well thought out in terms of what they're trying to do and why they're trying to do it. It's not always, you know, when you see these things, you think, oh, they're just stabbing for the sake of it. But there is a thought process. So we notice there's patterns of why is that happening? And then you realize, OK, this is what they're doing. But in the process of trying to stab from behind, sometimes that blade would be so big, it would go to the urinary bladder. And so then you're in the situations like, do they stab the underneath of the urinary bladder or the superior aspect of the urinary bladder? If they stab the underneath of the urinary bladder, you don't have as much of an implication of needing to do surgery because you can do a catheter and wait for the urinary bladder to sort of heal itself. But if it's an intraperitoneal injury, that means that the urine can actually spread into the intra-abdominal cavity. Mm. And so how are you going to tell that? So the way you do that is by putting contrast. Either you wait for the contrast to go through the whole body into the urinary bladder and see if any, any uh, contrast escapes. Or you put contrast into the urinary bladder via catheter and see if any contrast escapes into the intra-abdominal cavity from the urinary bladder. So that's another situation where in a sort of acute situation, it may be useful to use contrast in a different way. That's not oral that not, not everyone thinks about. And yeah, that's a really about. good point. I've never fortunately seen the stabbing scenario, but I've seen uh, yeah. pelvic fractures where we've uh, had to do that with um, retrograde urograms just to check mm. uh, whether there was any leaking from the bladder. So, yeah, I've seen that, but not 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 with the stabbings. But fortunately, that sounds absolutely hideous. But... Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, it's hideous. It's amazing. It's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, when you really learn and see these things, you just think, wow, Yeah, yeah. I, I remember working at St George's and the acuity and range of patients that we used to get through George's compared to 
rural and regional regional Australia because that's where our university is and that's where most mm. of our university students do their placements tend well I can't speak for them all obviously but tend not to hear stories like that fortunately it's mm. more and there's not really a gun problem here mm. stabbings well wow. maybe metropolitan but not not something I'm, I'm I'm overly familiar with thankfully <laughs> mm. that's good yeah it's uh, yeah, it's amazing to know the, the geographical patterns of violence. I mean, we know about the mm. geographical patterns of injury and disease, but there is actually a geographical pattern of violence. So like we did, I mean, obviously, you know, I do a podcast and we spoke to someone called Jamie Coleman, who is a trauma surgeon in America, and her experience of gunshot wounds mm. is just incredible. But but that's just the pattern of disease they get in America. That's, that's yeah. America. Uh, but in the UK, we won't have anything like that because no. guns are very, very rare. Very, very rare to have that kind of stuff. Um, but we get stabbings because it's easy enough to go to the shops and buy a big knife and go for it. So they may not have as much as that, but we they've got more experience of guns. So, I mean, that's why trauma is so interesting, isn't it? Uh, it is. I, I find it fascinating. I So one thing I really like about being a radiographer, there's nothing quite like, oh, it's say it's exciting because that makes it sound like I enjoyed that that situation. But you know what I mean? It's mm. quite, it's challenging mm. and it's it's really good to be part of that sort of bigger team and have to think on your feet and make decisions really quickly. So I, yeah, I really mm. did enjoy it at George's. It was mm. very, very intensive and, and very full on and very long hours. It was good. <laughs> Before yeah. I let you go, because I'm conscious of how yeah. much time I'm taking i have no, one fine, more fine, one more yeah. quick scenario hopefully if it's loaded i mm. know oh, of course i know it is so we're just going to do the same thing again if that's okay before i forget i have a little question for you i know that you've just finished um your period of fasting for for ramadan yeah. so yeah. happy eid eid mubarak thank you very i'm not much. sure how you yeah. say it properly but we thank really you try and be very culturally aware with our students obviously australia is a very multicultural society and it doesn't matter what religion you're from but i try and respect any of those you know events that's going on in someone's life mm. so what would happen if we had a patient who was fasting for ramadan but they needed oral mm. contrast so that's the thing like if it's for health reasons then you know they just got to have it there, there's yeah. no, and then in those situations you can make up the fast later but then i think same with any organized religion you'll have people who are dear to certain things more than others yeah and so officially the rulings as far as i understand is that for health reasons and that kind of thing you can actually uh, break your fast not fast and then make up for it later right but you get people who will say no i don't want to yeah. do that yeah fair and then, you know, it's up to them, you know, fair enough. Like you get all yeah. sorts, don't you? Absolutely. Um, you no, know. no, I just think it's nice to be aware of things that you mm. might come across in different cultures and different religions. Yeah. I'm a complete heathen, but within our family, we've got Catholics, we've got Hindus, we've got, mm. you know, all sorts. So it's just nice to be aware of um, other people's yeah. uh, beliefs. Mother all right. Family. Yeah, yeah, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> very much so. All right, so here is our second patient, a young-ish male mm -hmm. for a CT, again, of an abdomen, painless hematuria for a couple of days. Uh, mm. Not too bad blood pressure, not too bad. His O2 mm. heart rate's a little bit high, but, you know, he could just be nervous. Mm. In terms of allergies, he is anaphylactic to pineapple and his bloods are normal and he's definitely not pregnant. So mm. uh, start with the differentials for this this person. So again, I like to say he's young because he's not that much older than me. I'm a lot older yeah. than him. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so he, he's fairly young. And with pain, the thing is, painless hematuria is one of those things that, I mean, as soon as he's painless hematuria, you've got to think about malignancy. I mean, there's really, unless there's trauma involved or anything like that, you have to think about malignancy. And even in the UK or my particular hospital, We've got a hematuria pathway that is, if someone has that, you go straight down, they get the scan, and then you go to a painless, uh, you get go to a hematuria clinic, and then they get investigated further. So when you think about malignancy, you've got to think about a malignancy that can happen anywhere along the renal tract, because any bleeding that's going to happen in the urinary tract, i.e. prior to the kidneys, is not going to end up as a painless in the urinary bladder. This has to be coming from the kidney, the ureters, or the urinary bladder, or maybe even beyond, you know, urethra possibly. So then that's what you've got to think about. Okay, so if there's no trauma, then you've got to be thinking about malignancy. And then that malignancy could be anywhere along that track. Kidney, ur uh, urine, kidney collecting system, ureter, urinary bladder, urethra. And so in this situation, you need to think about, okay, 
you need to image that particular part of the body. And how do you do that is by giving contrast. You have to give contrast to the patient. Otherwise, it can be very, very difficult to really identify lesions. So as hopefully you will know, when you inject contrast into the human body, it gets filtered out by the kidneys and it goes down into the ureter and then into the urinary bladder. It just goes like, like one, one system. And so you have to try and get that scan in three uh, phases, essentially. So, I mean, you want to do a pre, actually, you want to do a pre-contrast study, first of all. And the reason you want to do a pre-contrast study is because sometimes you get calcifications, phleboliths, other parts of the body that look very, very dense, but are not contrast. And so if you've got the pre-contrast image and then you've got, you can compare it to a post-contrast image, you can see where there's contrast has made something highlighted or whether it was always highlighted, it was always going to be bright on the scanner, regardless of whether you gave contrast or not. So you can do a pre-contrast scan and then you're going to do a sort of delayed phase scan. And the delayed phase scan is going to be um, where you just wait for it to be, where you wait for the um, contrast to be within the, the kidneys, the ureters and through into the urinary bladder. And the reason for that is that you want to see if, let's say you've got a tube and you've got that contrast going through and there's a lesion, then the contrast will go around that lesion and then carry on, or the contrast will stop because it's such a big lesion, or you may see a big con- a lesion sitting within the kidney. And so that's why you want to do this sort of more delayed phase scan to be able to see whether this, this is going to be as a result of malignancy. Trauma will be slightly different, right? Because if you've got trauma, then you're thinking about lacerations. And again, you're going to be going down that, you know, you might want to do a slightly different phase rather than doing just a pre-contrast and a delayed, you might want to do a nephrogenic phase where you're actually kind of more concentrating on the kidney itself, if possible. But even a portal venous phase, a normal CT scan may be useful to look for um, a laceration because you get different grades of laceration when it comes to kidneys. And, you know, the bigger the grade, I think goes all the way to like five or six but well, I think grade three or four onwards would mean that the collecting system's involved and you can get significant bleed into the kidneys. But from what we see here, where they haven't written trauma, we don't have a significant low blood pressure. So we're not thinking that they're bleeding out like that last patient that we had. Yeah. Heart rate's a little bit high, but not massively high. You know, it doesn't sound like you're thinking about lacerations. It sounds like you're worried about there being some sort of malignancy. Young patient, it could be a TCC, which is a transitional cell carcinoma. I mean, more than likely in a younger patient, it's going to be a renal cell carcinoma. So that's why you'd be doing um, the kind of scans that I'm talking about to try and figure out, you know, where there is a lesion, where along the renal tract there is a lesion. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you are talking about the phases uh, because that's something that Mm. we go into fairly deeply in our uh, Mm. content. In I've noticed though in your protocol, it's slightly different to what I've been familiar with, and and that may be a reflection of where I'm working rather well, mm. where I was working rather than up-to-date knowledge I'll have to go away mm. and check actually but mm. normally in the Australian setting or in my experience at least as well as that pre-contrast and that delayed scan we would mm. have done a portal venous phase but just of the upper abdomen maybe that's one of that those legal, legacy practices that we're not supposed to do no, anymore no, no. but I've seen that I've seen that because obviously I work for other other hospitals yeah. And so obviously it depends on which uh, hospital you work for, but I do a bit of teleradiology and I have seen that. I have definitely seen that yeah. where they've um, just done the, the abdomen in portal venous phase. And one would assume is because they're thinking along the lines of whether there's actually a renal, like a proper renal lesion. But I think I must depend on the clinical scenario because if you've got a patient who's slow, so then you're probably going to be thinking more along the lines of a TCC, a transitional mm. cell carcinoma, more is going to be more likely in the older patients so you just try and sort of um try and get the best scan for those particular patients but i've i've seen what you're talking about i've definitely mm. seen what you're talking about so i don't think that's outdated at all yeah well, i will go away and check though that'll give me something uh, <laughs> to look at um mm. just moving down to the bottom in terms of the contrast information that's on this form so mm. we talk very openly and in depth about contrast reactions. I don't know if you're aware, but unfortunately in Australia a couple of years ago there was a contrast death. Obviously there's sadly contrast deaths, but there was a coroner's case. This was a wellness scan, a cardiac scan. This person, it was just like everything that could have gone wrong went wrong and the patient um, died. And so it's... It's cheese effect, isn't it? Yeah, it basically really was. Out of that, 
awful circumstance, the coroner's case actually holds a lot of really valuable information for students. And so we do mm. very delicately or appropriately discuss it. Mm. But one, one of the things that I try and sort of bring into the teaching for our students, hopefully that are sitting and listening to us waffling on, is other areas to think about sort of thinking outside of the square. Down to the contrast bit down the bottom. So what are your thoughts around the anaphylaxis and and specifically anaphylaxis to pineapple? Okay, so anaphylaxis in general, you've got to be very, very careful with, right? Because the last thing you want to have is an anaphylactic event within the scanner uh, and dealing with, you know, all the implications that can happen from that. So when you've got someone who is anaphylactic to pineapple, you've got to think to yourself that this patient may have other things that they're allergic to. You've got to be generally quite careful. As far as I understand now, pineapple can actually um, result in anaphylaxis to latex gloves. So you have to be, I mean, generally speaking, these days in the UK, actually, I've noticed that we moved away from latex gloves and we actually generally use non-latex gloves unanimously because, I mean, mistakes happen. You don't always ask and sometimes patients don't know. It's just better not to. So I guess it's something to be aware of. And if you've got the choice, you know, I would go for the non-latex gloves because anyone with any sort of anaphylaxis is going to have a predisposition predisposition to being allergic to other things that they may not be necessarily aware of. And, uh, you know, these things are foreseeably avoidable. You know, when you do root analysis of these things, it, I mean, they're avoidable, right? And the same as like when you go on the plane and they say, don't have any peanuts or something, you know, like it's avoidable, isn't it? And if it saves someone's life, then it's it's... A, you know, a minor inconvenience for, for everyone to use different gloves, right? So I think that is something like if you see something like that, it's worth being careful and using whatever whatever things you can to make sure that they, they're not exposed to anything else that could result in induce their reaction. I mean, you know, I mean, to the point that I'd say that if you're having a, a peanut butter sandwich behind, <laughs> behind the scanner, go wash your hands and then go see the patient just on the off chance because you never know, right? I agree. My son is anaphylactic to peanuts. So yeah, that there you go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've got to be really careful. So um, if yeah. you know someone's um, allergic, go wash your hands, wear non latex gloves, and then go see them. Yeah. In terms of phases, if I can just go back to phases really quickly. In mm-hmm. Australia, uh, and I'm sure all over the place, we we sometimes do we call it a three, two, one. Where you, and I think you did a little, I think you did a little talk on it where we can inject in different phases. Yeah, with the same. protocol. Yes. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts <laughs> on that in terms of the image quality and actually I finding cancers? Well, so what we used to do at Mount Vernon, which is a cancer center, is that we used to do CT chest in arterial phase, but go all the way to below the diaphragm to include yeah. the liver. Yep. And then we used to do portal venous phase going further down. And the, the reason for doing that was because there are liver lesions that enhance more on arterial phase images rather than the portal venous images. So on portal venous phase, it looks completely normal. And that's why it's really useful to go that bit further. But since working from that cancer center, I've seen some places just go you know, just one scan all the way through and they don't do arterial. They just, I think they just did Porta Venus all the way through. And I think that is a little bit, you've got to be careful. You've got to be really careful with that because you can miss uh, arterially enhancing liver lesions. So it's like so, just um, HCCs generally or are there other types of lesions as well? It would be generally HCCs, but actually meta- some metastases yeah, can actually be um, arterially, uh, arterially enhancing. Yep. So that's why it is useful. So whenever I do these cancer staging scans, I don't think my hospital makes a point of making sure they've got the entire liver, but I make sure I have a look at the liver on the arterial phase of the CT chest because there has been occasions when there is uh, a lesion that's only enhanced on the arterial. Yep. Now, I've never really seen a triple phase scan be done on cancer patients, generally speaking. These triple phase scans or, you know, these multi-phase scans are generally kept for, you know, trauma patients from my experience. Uh, yep. Yeah. I might be aware our protocols uh, vary a little bit because certainly for the painless hematuria, mm. that is something that would be done in, in my experience. Oh, they do. That's good. That's good because then you, you know, you potentially <laughs> scan less, don't you? I mean, yes. Well, basically, yeah, yeah in, in the long run. Mm. All right, my final question for you is um, not quite as serious as the discussion that we've had uh, just Mm -hmm. now. In my experience, in my wide experience of working with radiologists, there are broadly two types of radiologists, radiologists like Mm -hmm. you, 
who you can actually approach and who are pleasant yeah. to deal with. And then there's grumpy radiologists. And, and mm. I think all radiologists have a propensity to be a little bit grumpy. But w- mm. what are the top three things that do make you grumpy in terms of radiology? You know what? I don't even know anymore. I, I don't know. I feel like maybe I'm lucky. I don't know whether uh, maybe I'm lucky. I feel very lucky that I do genuinely enjoy my job, right? And I think that, you know, yeah, occasionally you get someone who doesn't sound like they know what they're talking about. But, you know, like I always think to myself, like, what was I like when I was in their situation? Is it really worth me getting aggravated, annoyed? Because, you know, you may have a bad experience with one person, but you don't want that to overspill to the next person. And at the, at the end of the day, if you've got a health professional that wants a scan or needs a scan, then you've got to take them seriously on some level. So even if you, if, even if it's in the back of your head, I'm thinking to myself, this sounds like a complete waste of time. You know what? The ones that are wasted to feel like a waste of time sometimes end up being like the ones that are not a waste of time. Like mm. even if it's an incidental, like genuinely, if it's an, even if it ends up being an incidental finding of a renal lesion or a hepatic lesion, it's very difficult to look back and say, well, you know, they got the scan for the wrong reasons, but they found it came out with like a positive finding. It doesn't matter. I mean, you got a positive finding and potentially interesting scan. So maybe I'm a little bit selfish when it comes to this stuff, but like every single scan that comes my way is a potential learning experience and a potential interesting scan, you know? And so like, if someone comes to me and asking for a scan, then I'm like more inclined to say yes, just in the off chance of thinking like anatomically interesting or something pathologically interesting, you know? And I know... I know not everyone is like that, and I don't. I'm not sure why, personally. <laughs> not old and jaded enough yet. That's why. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Genuinely, like sometimes they're like, oh, "I'm sorry, it's really busy." I'm like, "Mate, you carry on. If you want to scan more, you carry on. I'll do as many as I can when I'm here. Like, because this is what I do. This is what I enjoy. So I guess it just depends. I, I, yeah, maybe it's all, uh, when you get older and jaded. I, I just think, I think for some reason, I've noticed among amongst health, health professionals, and I talk about this on my podcast a lot, is that a lot of health professionals look at other health professionals and feel like they don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And as a result of that, they kind of almost look down on them. And it, it's a shame because none of us can do our jobs without each other. Now, I can't do my job without yourself, right? So if you came to me and said, you know, ask me something, maybe I know something more about that particular subject, but there'll be plenty of things that you know about more than me. So there's no point in getting high and mighty about it. And, you know, our trajectories in life are different because of our upbringings and where we're from and who we know and, you know, whatever took our fancy at that time. So I would always say that someone could do what I do if they had the same life I had or some same opportunities I had and vice versa. Like I could do what you do if I had the same opportunities you did. There's no point in getting a high horse about this stuff. It's just, it's just, it's work, it's a job, and you're trying to help people at the end of it. So I don't know. With the, mis- when the, with the ones that are miserable, I always think to myself, don't ever take it personally. They've probably got something else going on in their life. There's something about them that are making them unhappy or making them be like that. Yeah, that's something really good advice. That's that's a, to do with you. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. How, I, how I think about it. Um, and, that, mm. and that's what I say to my students, funnily enough, but kind of hard to deal with as a fresh student and sometimes they come across uh, this kind of scenario and it and it's very real yeah especially in it is private practice as well within australia it's a slightly different dynamic um Mm. to the nhs i'm not sure if you work outside the nhs but just just very slightly different because the the reason for doing things is slightly different it's it can be Mm. sort of money orientated rather than patient care so yeah, I agree. Uh, but I think also a lot of this to do with your own, uh, obviously you, you mentioned it can be, it's your own experience and maybe if you're more junior, you're not convinced of your own value and what mm. value you can bring to the table. But, you know, you have to know that you are there for a reason, you're a professional and you may not realise it, but let's say you called in sick, like everyone would miss you because you <laughs> need the work done. So that must mean that you're valuable on some level, right? So I just know that when I was in F1, so this is a junior, the junior doctor, I took two weeks of annual leave when I came back, they were like so happy that I was back. And I was like, wow, I'm actually useful. Like I never thought that I was useful. I thought I was a hindrance. And so I think that's your own, your, you kind of got to get to your own mind that like you're there and you've been paid to do a job and you're qualified and uh, you, you do bring something to the table, you know, and if you've got concerns, you've got concerns. Like the, and at the end of it all, the byproduct of anyone's so I've, I've noticed that people do medicine and healthcare for very different reasons. Like you said, there is going to be financial incentives for what people do sometimes. But the the inadvertent outcome is that you are trying to help a person, a patient on some level. So even if someone comes in for a useless scan and they're self-funding, 
Uh, the fact that they uh, men- they want a, for the mental benefit, they want to scan. That the byproduct is a positive thing. So I just don't think um, people should get too worked up about about it. Just like think about the byproduct of this. I'm doing something good. That's the main thing, and just go with it. You know, yeah. So a Absolutely. bit philosophical there, but that's it. It was philosophical, but I, I, I like <laughs> a bit of philosophy, and it's probably a good note to end on, given that mm. it's uh, it's nearly my bedtime. So of thank course, you. yeah, the time difference. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. Cool. Um, once again, and yeah, no I'll, I'll add no in a, a plug for your uh, podcast. I think, did I see you on TikTok as well now? Oh, God, I do it all these days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I just enjoy it. It's so ridiculous. And I think uh, a few people have been like, mate, I've seen your TikToks. And I, I know, look, I, I, I like to have my fun and uh, play around with the rest of the kids on social media and then um, do my day job. Yeah. Oh, no, thank <laughs> but, yeah, you. Well, all got, of it. Like I said, we, we found your uh, videos really helpful. And I certainly find myself even being an old bird looking at tiktok there's actually some really useful like anatomy stuff there's certainly some useful yeah, radiology yeah. stuff on there my son who's 18 has learned to cook i'm pretty happy about that so you know social <laughs> media is not all bad there's certainly yeah, some, exactly. some benefits for it so all right yeah, yeah. well again thank you for your time and so hopefully welcome. at some point we may catch up and talk about something else who knows yeah no worries